Hello and welcome to Bay College's online lectures for college algebra. I'm Jim Helmer and in this section we're going to look at 6.2 which deals with inverse functions. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at some relations. The relation of these points here, we want to ask, is this a function? If we recall, in order to be a function, it would have to pass what we call that vertical line test, which means the x values do not repeat. Well, if I look at this, I have negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 2. These are unique x values. No, none of them repeat. So is this a function? Yes, it is. Now, when we talk about an inverse, an inverse of a function is essentially replacing all the x values with the y values and the y values with x values. We invert our values. So the inverse, and I'll just write it right here, is going to be negative 27, negative 3. I just flip my x's and y's. This is going to be negative 8, negative 2. This is going to be negative 1, negative 1. If I flip them, it doesn't change for that particular point. Same with this one, 0, 0, flip them. And then the last one, 8, 2. Now, is this inverse a function? Well, negative 27, negative 8, negative 1, 0, and 8, we see the new x values after we've inverted them do not rep repeat. So is the inverse a function? Yes, it is. Well, let's combine those to save a little bit of time. And let's look at this next one here. Here we have this relation here. Is it a function? Negative 3, 4, negative 1, 2, 3. We see that the x values do not repeat. So this would be a function. Now, is its inverse a function? Now, we could take the time to rewrite all of these points, but our y's become our x's and our x's become our y's. Well, in order for its inverse to be a function, the new x values cannot repeat. Well, the new x values came from the y's. So let's look. I have 9, negative 2, 1, 4, and 9. Well, if we look here, the y value repeats in our original function. So if we flip the points, our x, new x value will then repeat, which means its inverse is not a function. Essentially, what we want to define in order to find the inverse of a function, the first thing is to define that it is a one-to-one -one function. That means each x value corresponds to a unique y value. Um, and we'll look at a test that we can use very similar to the vertical line test called the horizontal line test. Essentially, for each x, there is a unique y. For each y, there is a unique x. So we see that would be a one-to-one -one function. Let's look at what an inverse function actually is. The inverse function, and we use notation f inverse, inverse as an exponent, this is only notation. It does not mean 1 over the function. It is not a mathematical operation. It is only notation. So it's just saying inverse, because that is our inverse exponent. So <clears throat> what is an inverse function? Well, an inverse function is the equal and opposite of a function. It undoes its original function. And if you recall from the previous section when we talked about composite functions, this is essentially a composite function. If I have an input of x and I put it into a function, its output is f evaluated at x, f of x. Well, is there a function where I can take f of x, my output of the original function, and put it into its inverse function to get my original input back? So we get back what we started. That's what an inverse function does. It undoes its inverse function. Now, I did mention composite functions. If we can take a composite function of its inverse, the inverse of a function evaluated for the function is the original input, x. It undoes all this work here to get back to my input. And we'll explore that a little bit more, but let's, let's define how can we find an inverse first. Well, let's look at this function. This is a quadratic function. It's our library function, f of x equals x squared. 
Well, we can use something called the vertical line test to determine if it's a function. For each x, it only corresponds to uh, a y, so x is unique. Now, to determine if its inverse has a function, I can use what's called the horizontal line test. So I'm going to draw a horizontal line here. How many times does it intersect the graph? Twice. So th its inverse is not a function. It does have an inverse, but this is not a function. This is actually the inverse. If I were to graph this, it would be a parabola on its side. Because I replaced the x values with y values, essentially I take this and I turn it on its side. I rotate it. I change my axes, x and y. When I switch my x's and y's, I switch everything x and y. Every point, domain, range, the whole works. And we see this, we know this is not a function because it wouldn't pass the vertical line test. And that's why we can use something called the horizontal line test. If I do a horizontal line test, that just tells me its inverse is not a function. So this is not one to one. There are two values for y. Now, if we look at a cubic function, f of x equals x cubed, this is our library function. This is a function because it passes the vertical line test. Well, if I want to know if its inverse is a function, I can use the horizontal line test. No matter where I would draw a horizontal line, it's only going to intersect this graph once everywhere. And if we look at the inverse, you notice I wrote it as a function using function notation, something I couldn't do here. But I can here because it is a function. This would pass the vertical line test because this passed the horizontal line test. So a function has an inverse only if it's one to one. It would have an inverse function, right? The function is, or the inverse is also a function. Now, the reason why that is is because we have to look at what's happening to the function as we move left to right. If you recall, when we discussed increasing or decreasing functions, if we look at this, our parabola, it is a decreasing function and then switches to increasing. That is going to make its inverse not a function. If we look at this cubic function, it's increasing on any interval. It's always increasing. So if it's always increasing, it's going to be a one-to-one -one function. Each x is going to correspond to a y. The next x corresponds to a greater y. The next x corresponds to an even greater y. So it's always increasing in this example. If we look at this, well, this is doing the same thing. It has the same increase on its domain. So if we want to uh, explore this a little bit more, let's look at this example right here. Let's say we have. Uh, this relationship and this relationship. And we want to know, is it a function? Well, first of all, my x values do not repeat, so it is a function. The y values don't repeat. Well, that tells me it's one to one function. This is its inverse. Let's first define domain. Because we've already defined that if we switch x's and y's, we get the inverse. Well, what happens to the domain? Well, the domain of this would be negative 1, 0, and 6. The range of this would be 3, 4, and 10. Now, let's look at the domain and range of its inverse. Well, the domain is 3, 4, and 10. And its range is negative 1, 0, and 6. What, what do we notice here? Well, I notice that the domain of my function is the same as the range of its inverse. And I notice the range of my function is the domain of the inverse. And this is a great concept to keep in mind. If we're replacing x's with y's to find an inverse, we're also replacing domains with the range and range with domain. So we switch both of them. Every property of x switches to a property of y. And every property of y switches to a property of x. That's what happens with inverses. They undo one another. So let's see what we have to do to algebraically find the inverse of a function. Well, first of all, we look at this function, f of x equals 3x plus 7. This here is 
a one-to-one -one function. It's a linear equation. It would pass both my vertical and horizontal line test. So I'm just going to sketch the graph of this function right here, where this is my y-intercept 0, 7. So there we have this function right here. Now, how would I find the inverse of this function algebraically? Well, let's just for a moment replace f of x with a y value, because that's what it is on our graph. Now, to find its inverse, well, essentially, I want to replace every x value for a y value and every y value for an x value. So we can do that algebraically. Change y to x and x to y. Now, to find the function, the inverse function, excuse me, all I have to do is solve this for y. I'm going to undo this math. This says take 3 times x and add 7. Well, in order to solve for y, I'm going to take away 7 and divide by 3. It's equal and opposite operations in every aspect. So let's subtract 7 to bring this over here, and then divide by 3 to get y by itself. This is the inverse function. It has the inverse operation. It'll undo anything this does. Now, now that I've written it this way, I can change this y to our new notation, the inverse function of x. So here we have it. Now, recall I talked about composite functions, and we discussed those in the previous section. We can actually use composite functions to check our work, to make sure this is a true statement. If we have an input of x here, its composite function should undo all that work so that its output becomes x. Well, let's take a look at a composite function. Let's evaluate this. f inverse of f of x equals x. I'm going to take this function here, oh, x minus 7 divided by 3. And in place of the x, I'm going to put the whole function f of x, 3x plus 7. Now, if I do a little bit of simplification here, well, 7 minus 7, that cancels out. And I have 3x over 3. 3 over 3 reduces to 1. All that's left is this x over 1, which is just x. Every function, if we do a composite function of its inverse and the function, it will always equal x. It undoes all the work to give me back my original input into the function. So it's a tool we can use. Now, we've done this algebraically. Let's take a moment to look at the graph. If I were to graph this function, its inverse on here, we could Go ahead and do that, but I'm going to take a little shortcut. I know that it contains the point 7, 0 if I just invert this. Well, 7, 0 is this point right here, an inverse value. All right, And I could plot some other points. And when I do, I'm going to get that as the function. Now, if we think about this just for a moment, let's inspect this graph. If we're replacing x's with y's and y's with x's to find the inverse function, if we take a moment to look at this right here, the identity function, y equals x, everything up here is mirrored through y equals x. Well, let's think about what is y equals x or x equals y, our identity equation. If I'm replacing x's with y's, it doesn't change this equation. It's it in itself is its own inverse. So what happens here is this line, my original function, f of x, if I reflect it through y equals x, just like we did reflections through axes or through the origin, well, now we're reflecting it through the plane x equals y. If I reflect it, I have the graph of its inverse. Change my x values for y's and my y values for x. It just basically reflects it through y equals x. It's a good tool. If I know the graph of one function, I can use this mirror image to graph its inverse just like that. All right, <clears throat> let's look at one more example where we're going to solve algebraically. I want to find the inverse of the function x cubed plus 1. In order to do that, I'm essentially going to replace this with a y for the moment. 
And then I'm going to say, well, it's time to find the inverse. Let's replace the x value with y and the y value with an x. So instead of the x being cubed, now I have y being cubed. All right, and let's undo this math. Let's get y by itself. I'm going to subtract 1 from both sides. And then to get rid of this cubed, I'm going to take the cubed root of both sides. If I do that, I get the cubed root of x minus 1 equals y. Now this is my inverse function, so I'm just going to rewrite it here. The cubed root of x minus 1. This is the inverse function. Let's go ahead and put it on a graph. Well, let's first graph this one here. And I'll use a different color. We'll graph this one in blue, x cubed plus 1. Well, x cubed is one of my library functions. And if we recall the section on transforms, I just have to shift it up 1. So my library function is going to look like that. So I just took my cube function and I shifted the whole thing up 1. Now this here, well, this is my cubed root function. And if I want to graph that, well, it's a little bit, maybe it's not as familiar to us. Uh, we could use transforms here. Now the h value just says it shifted back 1. But let's use the y equals x in order to graph this. If y equals x, hopefully that's a relatively straight line, y equals x, right through the origin there. And I'm just going to reflect it. Well, what I see down here, I can reflect up here. And what I see, let's say just between the axes here, is this curve right here. And I can continue on to this right here and just continue towards there and then away. And if we look at this, I was able to graph its inverse just by reflecting it through the line. Well, let's see what happens if I choose a point. What if x is 0? Well, if x is 0, the square root of negative 1 is negative 1. When x is 0, this is negative 1. So we know that point's on the graph. Well, if this is a point, then its inverse should also be a point. Well, is this point? Actually, that would be its inverse. Sorry about that. Its inverse would be maybe this point over here, which would be negative 1, 0. Well, let's see. Let's plug that into this function that corresponds to the blue line. If I put in negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, plus 1 is 0. So yeah, we can see these points are on here. This is an accurate graph, or a sketch of the graph, of a function and its inverse. And now it's time for your quiz to see if you understand the concept or if you can apply it. It's actually going to be a review of the previous section. Your quiz is to show that the inverse function evaluated for the function equals x using these two here. So take the composite function of f inverse of f of x to show that it equals x. Show that algebraically. That'll be your quiz. Make sure you understand it. This has been section 6.2, uh, inverses. Thank you for watching.